think in addition to not thinking across decades, I think the left doesn't think across issues. And so I think that we say, like, as long as I get what I want for unions, or as long as I get what I want for the environment, or as long as I get what I want for LGBTQ rights. So we're not just that we're thinking in too short terms, but we're siloed across issues. Yep. And I think those are, are the two. Are you saying we need to be intersectional? Is that what you're yep. saying, Dahlia? What a, what a novel concept. <laughs> I mean, it's so radical to say that any of these wins, and like, you know who should have learned this, by the way, with all due respect, was Barack Obama. Obama, right? Like that you can pass the ACA and you can get the contraception mandate and you can just keep losing in the courts. And, you know, I, I think it's it's a lesson that's painful in the rearview mirror. Uh, on the other point, I guess I would just say this. The Federalist Society does a bunch of things. And, you know, we call it bootstrapping in the article because they hold themselves out as a debate society, right? They initially said that they were building an organization that was going to, this is going to sound familiar, kind of respond to the hegemonic control of the left um, in legal education. And so they just wanted to sort of surface conservative ideas, and that's how they held themselves out. But Leonard Leo is fantastically good at two things. One is raising money, which he did by the fistful. And the other is just creating this pipeline you're describing, which is identifying in first year of law school the young kind of superstar conservative thinkers and then making sure they have the right clerkships, making sure they have the right summer jobs, making sure that when they graduate from, you know, their clerkships, they're vaulted into whatever the next obvious opportunity is. Look, it's not an accident that John Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett all worked on Bush v. Gore, right? Like that is just a, a, a very, very effective machine to create what will be baby Supreme Court judges. And by the way, they all clerked for Supreme Court justices before, right? So this didn't used to happen. It was not kind of weaponized that by second year of law school, you were on a trajectory to just keep succeeding up. And then you get hired by these feeder judges, and then the feeder judges send you to the Supreme Court, and then you're Brett Kavanaugh. And then you're Amy Coney Barrett, right, who'd only been on an appeals court for two years. So I think that, like, again, credit where it's due, if you create that kind of machine— and it's really lean and successful, and you pour money into, you guys may recall, the attack ads that suggested that Merrick Garland was soft on guns. Dude never had a Second Amendment opinion. He was like one of an en banc court that, you know, they, they, they spent so much money trying to quash any possibility of him being seated with this just fabricated story that he didn't support gun rights. So it's kind of the same thing that you see unloosed in all of politics, right? Big money just drowning out merit, drowning out truth. And Leonard Leo has just been supercharged good at that. And maybe just the very last point on this is that one of the reasons he stepped away from senior leadership at Federalist Society was to do what is basically vote suppression, <laughs> like to do uh, efforts to set aside votes. So he has a finger in sort of every piece of what is most pathological that's going on right now. But he also has this like army of judicial mini-me's who are doing willing to do things like, you know, what we saw yesterday in Texas, which is, oh, you know, you can't uh, force doctors to perform uh, abortion abortions because it violates state sovereignty and dignity. Those are those are Trump judges and we're going to live under their, you know, thumb for decades, decades to come. That's all Leonard Leo and that's big money. You know, so since you've painted such a rosy picture of our future, <laughs> um, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, <laughs> no, it's, uh, people come here for the truth. Um, here, here's the question that I have, though. Um, because you've signaled in the ways in which Democrats have had a breakdown in their messaging, a breakdown in their pipeline building, because the things that we said post Obama, right, which was where is where is everybody else? Where is the pipeline that is coming behind Barack Obama that isn't just looking at the presidency, but is looking at the courts, is looking at agencies, is looking in industry? You know, what we are setting ourselves up for, what or what that screensaver mentality has set us up for, um, 
is, you know, is the crumbling of our democracy, but generations of authoritarianism. And I'm wondering if you see any opportunity in this breakdown for Democrats, progressives, the hard, the hard left to actually harden, right? To actually not just believe that voting alone is going to save us. Because I think that this has been the problem. We just tell people that all they need to do is go to the polls, but we don't tell them why, right? We say, if you care about abortion, go and vote. Or if you care about, like you said, if you care about, you know, voter, uh, voter suppression, go to the polls, but we don't connect the dots, right? And say very clearly how this is all feeding in and why most of the rights that we all enjoy didn't come from policy and collaboration in the Senate, right? Or come from the, the president's desk. It came through the court system. And this is what Republicans have always known and have seen. So they created this plan. And I'm wondering, you know, sometimes when there are breakdowns, there are opportunities for breakthroughs. And I want to see, you know, do you get a sense that we are now at the point of crisis, compounded crises, that there is an opportunity, not tomorrow, but in forethought to be able to fight back in a way um, that, that doesn't have us lose everything. So, Danielle, I feel like nobody has been clearer than you and maybe than the two of you on this point that is that there are a lot of people who are coming around to realize that vote suppression is a thing. Whereas if you were a person of color trying to vote in America ever, it is not news to you, right? I, mm. Catherine Frankie at Columbia Law School made this point to me when SB8 happened this year, and I was freaking out. You know, one-tenth of the childbearing population no longer has access to abortion in the state of Texas. And her argument, and again, you all know this, is that if you were a person of color in Alabama or yep. Mississippi or Louisiana, that was a paper right from the day Roe v. Wade was signed into law. And partly thanks to the Hyde Amendment, but partly because yep. we have illusions, right, about everybody can just drive to the local library and drop their ballot off. And that's not how people vote. That's how, like, wealthy white people vote, right? And, you know, that you can go and collect your daughter at college and bring her to New York and get uh, an abortion. That's how you can do it if you're privileged, right? So I think the number one most important breakthrough, and this sounds like it's just words, and I don't think it's just words, is that people are awake, and Waj has a really nice piece from yesterday just talking about embracing the word woke. But I think that part of looking around and saying, holy hell, there are people who have been standing in line in Georgia for 30 years, and now we all have to stand in line. And like, that's not a bad thing to just look around and realize that a lot of the things that we thought were fundamental rights and freedoms and liberties were on paper Always. Mm. And that goes to the second part of, like, I think the breakthrough, which is the system is operating exactly as it was designed, right? That's why we have an electoral college. That's why we have a malapportioned Senate. That's why we have a Supreme Court that is constituted of people who were seated by presidents who lost by many, many votes the majority vote, right? So this is a minoritarian rule system that was constructed to be precisely that mm. by the framers. And there are a lot of people now who are looking around and being like, well, but the electoral college sucks then. Or like, it makes no sense that people in Wyoming get two senators and so do people in California. And those moments of looking at the what you're describing as these fissures or cracks and breaks in the system mm -hmm. and a acknowledging that they now apply to you and yep. your kids and that b they were designed to do precisely what they are currently doing those are not trivial recognitions and i really really think that if i see a silver lining to the past couple of years. It's that an awful lot of people, and this is very much like what we saw around police violence and Black Lives Matter, that this is not other people's problem. This is everyone's problem. And that solves, by the way, both the silo problem we started with and Waj's problem of thinking in long term, right? Those are not nothings. Now, I do think that 
fundamentally, the solution to losing the courts, probably for a generation, was court expansion and term limits and all the things yep. that the Biden commission just kind of batted away. And that is a problem of we're 10 years behind. We should have been having this conversation the day Anthony Kennedy mm. stepped down. But I mm -hmm. do think that there's really, really an opportunity for people to say exactly where you started, Danielle, which is, I thought my vote mattered. I thought if the polling shows that everybody, including Republicans, doesn't think that a woman should have to bleed out or get sepsis before she can get emergency medical treatment, and nobody thinks that that's the case, and it seems that my vote may not remedy that, then we can talk about these big structural things. And it's not, just to go back to, again, where we started, as fun and interesting as talking about marriage equality, fun and interesting as talking about, you know, other big wins that we focused on. These are boring, mechanical systems problems, but they are systems problems that have produced exactly the outcome those systems were designed to do. And so for me, like if we can look around and say, holy crap, if we don't nip this like independent state legislature thing in the bud, and by there the way, go. it's going to be <laughs> heard this fall and it's going to- That's what I wanted to ask you about. It's going mean, to allow I mean, states I'm to set aside election results. <laughs>